the name of this presentation is Imposing Limitations. And limitations are something that's very much been on our mind for, say, the last six, seven months, as we've all been living under conditions of, in some cases, extreme limitations, and certainly limitations imposed upon us um, by forces beyond our control. And, you know, so my students at the Maryland Institute College of Art have been struggling with this. Um, and in some cases, and in some cases have been kind of inspired by it to find new ways of, of working that have brought them to, to create results that they would not have otherwise uh, achieved. So Kay and I thought that we would um, put our minds together and draw out some lessons from our practice where limitations are, are such a vital kind of part of what we do to maybe give you some, some insight and some thought that might inspire you. So um, we'd like to start by um, telling you a little bit about what we do. And so this is a, 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 our signature piece called After Image Requiem. Um, some prints from it are in the, the Apex Art Show and the audio as well. And, uh, you know, it, it's quite a thing to behold. <laughs> I'll say, trying not to brag here, but it's, it's something that, that, you know, we, we came to through very much the kind of processes that we'll talk about today of, of kind of pushing against limitations. Um, but in order to kind of get you to, to hear, we'll tell you a little bit about who we are and how we met. And I guess also like, as Andy was saying, like this, like this workshop and talking about limitation, we use a lot of limitation in our artwork to how to make artwork, how we frame the artwork. Um, so it, the, the presentation is gonna be more like talking about our previous project, but we are hoping like you guys can like kind of take like what we, how we use limitation and apply to your practice too. Um, so a quick, quick uh, recap of like my life and how we, how we influenced my art. Um, so my, uh, so my artwork is deeply influenced by my grandfather. Uh, my grandfather was in Hiroshima when a bomb exploded. He was 15, 15, 15 years old, uh, working at the ammunition factory, um, almost forced to work uh, to create ammunition. Uh, he survived the bombing, but his family were lost uh, from the bombing and radiation poisoning. He himself suffered from a uh, heavy radiation poisoning and eventually passed away through uh, cancer. Uh, he was quite well known, uh, the anti-activist uh, anti-nuclear activist, that he went to states, uh, that's Washington DC right there. Uh, he went to Russia, he was invited by UN to give a talk, uh, but eventually he passed uh, when I was nine years old. Um, and if you can go to the next slide, Andrew. Um, so uh, one of the, so I was nine and I don't remember much of him uh, besides just being a great grandfather. Um, but one thing I remember him telling me was the day of Hiroshima was like hundreds of suns lighting up the sky. And that statement of witnessing hundreds of suns kind of like haunted me my childhood and un even until today. Um, so I really wanted to express uh, this statement uh, through my practice, which was a photography. Um, and I was trying to find a way, like if the camera, photography was about camera and the camera is about to take a picture of something in front of you, how do I capture something that's invisible, something that's gone, uh, something such as fragile idea as a memory? Um, my answer was to get rid of the camera to use a pure sense of photography, which is a light sensitiveness. Um, what I did was I took uh, the color darkroom paper, uh, AKA chromogenic print um, to a certain exposure uh, of the sunlight. Well, essentially it's just the, the co window covered with the, the cardboard and a little bit of sunlight comes. It's essentially a pinhole. Expose it to duration of my breath. So each print is the exposure time. And I did it 408 times, which connect to kind of like uh, my childhood and um, like Japanese Buddhism. Um, but I'm not gonna go into detail. Uh, you can read in my statement. 
Um, and I did it 108 times and I processed it. I didn't know what kind of image they I was gonna get. And I was actually surprised how some like prints I got. And this kind of process became my signature. Uh, ever since I don't really use camera except for some of the artwork I'm gonna be sharing today. Um, and I kind of became a cameraless photography, um, kind of like I'm imposing myself a limitation to not to use camera, but still calling it photography. And ironically, it, it, in the end, it pushes the photography even more because it questions the media. Um, and so that this is kind of like my base signature piece, which is part of the, the Apex Art Elongated Shadow. Um, but kind of like I built upon and upon using same technique, because I really do think that's my foundation and kind of go along with the, the theme, I suppose. Um, so a little bit about my background. Um, I started off a, a painter many moons ago. I uh, went to Rutgers, New Jersey, studied there. And um, this is my grandfather, who I did not know well. He was very, he was pretty secretive, mysterious person. And he also passed away when I was uh, a little kid. Um, he was an engineer and he did work during World War II for the Manhattan Project, kind of work contributing to the creation of the atomic bomb. And this was something I knew about growing up, certainly didn't know what, what exactly he did. And that's still something I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, um, inching closer and closer. Um, so when Kay and I met at the beginning of grad school, we, we went to MICA, where I now teach together, and we lived together. Um, school started off pretty busy, and, and Kay arrived just before school began. So we didn't really have time to, to catch up and talk about where we were from and what our families were about and all of that. But a couple of weeks into school, when we finally did, Kay told me that his grandfather was in Hiroshima when we dropped the atomic bomb there and uh, I took a breath. I told him, well, my grandfather helped to create the atomic bomb. And we had this moment and I think we hugged it out and vowed that we would go on one day to, to collaborate on this theme. Now Kay kind of got to, to making work directly about this sooner than I did. Um, I had some forays in some other directions and we'll talk about that shortly, but um, so, you know, over the years, I'd gone from being a painter to, to being, uh, you know, someone working with digital media, so digital photography and video, but especially audio. I did a lot of work with audio, um, teaching it, working as an audio engineer, as a composer, as a sound designer. But I, one of the reasons why I came to grad school is trying to figure out how I might really be a sound artist. Like, what, what might that practice actually mean? How might I put my skill set to work? And what I eventually arrived at was kind of doing multi-channel installation work, right? Where there's more than two loudspeakers. Um, and for me, they're arrayed in such a way that, that um, there's no sweet spot. There's no central privileged location uh, that you're supposed to, to listen from. And we'll talk a little bit about that in, you know, shortly. Um, so anyway, here's us looking cute together, looking at a shadow and, um, here you can see us reflected in the window of the cockpit of the airplane that dropped the, the atomic bomb in Hiroshima. So, okay, limitations. So uh, a limitation that, that uh, I had to face right away when I started kind of really working as a sound artist was the challenges of multi-channel installation. Um, the art world is not well set up to accommodate loudspeakers, right? Especially in group shows or settings where like, uh, you know, a gallery assistant or a, a, an office worker has to kind of be around the work all day. Um, I, I was lucky enough to get a chance to exhibit a solo piece uh, during grad school shortly after the Baltimore uprising, which was uh, an event in, in, in Baltimore where the people kind of rose up uh, in protest against the, the killing by Baltimore police of a young man named Freddie Gray. And so I, I made a piece that responded to that. And, um, you can see that, that the show was in this corridor, right? So I wanted the piece to kind of respond to this strange setting, right? How can I use loudspeakers in a corridor in a, in a way that's not um, just kind of bothersome? So I decided to kind of use this long axis in the way that people would traverse or kind of walk up and down the corridor. And uh, I was inspired to make a piece where you can't listen to, to more than one or two loudspeakers at a time, right? Because the, the audio from, from further ones away will kind of 
blend together and mask each other, right? So um, showering in this corridor kind of unlocked something for me, which is that we choose what we, what we listen to, right? And that choice is potentially and, and actually usually political, you know, has political ramifications. So this, this strange and in, in some ways unideal location really kind of um, got me on my way as a sound artist, right? The limitation forced me to, to, to think in a way I would not have otherwise. Um, I went on to do an, uh, another piece shortly thereafter with similar content um, in this kind of big group show where uh, the, the piece works similarly. You have to kind of step through these two bigger loudspeakers to, to, to be able to hear uh, what's going on in the third one behind it, right? Um, but the form couldn't be as expansive as the other piece. So I had to figure out a way to, to play nice with these other works in this group show, right? And uh, create a piece that sonically would not be brutal for the, the security guard who had to work near it. That was a lesson I learned from this other piece where I probably tortured the, the office workers nearby um, more so than, than, than I, I feel comfortable with in, in retrospect. Um, so here's how people would tend to experience it, right? Um, he had to figure out a way to kind of lure them into the piece since that's what that carpet does. So I was able to kind of develop this a little further with my thesis work, which finally was kind of work about the atomic bombing of, of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the development of the bomb. It was called Manhattan Project. And uh, so just behind this wall you're seeing uh, was another piece and to our left was another piece um, that all these had audio. And to our right, past that kind of small wall, was a security desk for a security guard and a, a very loud cafe. So I had to figure out how to, how to engage with this space, which was both loud, but demanded some, some limitations on volume from me, right? And how, you know, how, could I, how could I try to use this space to pull someone in, keep them involved, and uh, not just annoy the, the people who had a right <laughs> and an obligation to kind of be stuck in one place all day, right? Right nearby. So from working in this space, I, I came to a way of kind of mixing and working with my sound where, where it could be effective not at loud levels, um, where I would kind of pull you from one loudspeaker to another uh, and, and kind of build a narrative around that, but also maybe kind of allow my work to commingle and, and cooperate with other seemingly unrelated sounds around it, right? So this space was quite a revelation as well. Um, it was interesting too, to kind of get to use the walls in this space to create uh, a, a kind of, um, a dynamic between scale and height that was a little bit different. And that was something that you know, I go on to explore with my work with Kay. So shortly after all this, Kay and I finally got to really start collaborating in earnest and we created a piece called Ash Lexicon Silver Plate. And uh, I'll let Kay tell you a little bit about uh, his component to that and how he worked with um, material in, in a way that was kind of constrained and, and disciplined and limited uh, that has really kind of set us off in some interesting directions. I guess to, before we talk about Ash Lexicon Silver Plate, uh, so this project uh, I made with Andrew was kind of like a uh, evolution from the previous project I worked on during my grad school. Uh, one of the last camera-based project I, have, I, I did. Um, so this is kind of interesting like in terms of the limitation. Um, so even though I was born in Japan and lived there up uh, when I was 15, then I moved to New Zealand and all that jazz. But so I haven't really been to Hiroshima myself. I only been there four times total, three times with uh, during my childhood uh, with my grandfather or my parents. Uh, but the one time I went was uh, 2015. No, 2000. <laughs> yeah, that, that would be it. It was 2015. Was it 2015? Yeah, yeah, that's five years ago. Um, uh, 2015. Uh, that was uh, anniversary of the week of the anniversary of uh, Hiroshima Day, uh, and I actually traced my grandfather's footstep of how he is escaped Hiroshima, who he escaped with. Uh, I'm I I was fortunate enough to talk to some of his friend who survived the bombing together. Uh, unfortunately, he was on the, the hospital bed, so I only could talk to him for like a few minutes. Um, so I wanted to, I didn't really have any sets of project when I went to Hiroshima. 
Uh, but I wanted to create something of like a, a three weeks of the, the time I'm going to be spending Hiroshima. So one of the projects I came up with is the, 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 the prints you're seeing. Uh, it's a location I calculated um, roughly um, where the, the, the sun and where ABOM exploded uh, approximately uh, 500 to 800 meter from the ground. Is it about right, Andrew? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's, there's no accurate thing, but like just roughly, it's gonna be visually corresponding at the time the ABOM exploded 70 years ago. Um, and uh, I calculated, I, it, it happened to be one of the, uh, the tall buildings, uh, the, it, was a, it belonged to the newspaper company. So I needed to go in, ask them the permission to be there on the morning of August 6th. And I managed to take a photograph. Um, and that itself was a piece, but I, I felt that piece needed some kind of addition to the piece. So if you can go to the next slide. Um, so I created this sculptural piece. Uh, I still call it photography, um, uh, based off of one of the book my grandfather wrote. Uh, my grandfather wrote, uh, as he was, when he was a kid, he cherished this Japanese dictionary uh, so much that he read it every day, even during the wartime. Um, after he went back to his home to, or after he witnessed the bomb and went back to the, to the home to try to find his family, um, only thing he found was complete burnt dictionary on the ground. Uh, and surprisingly enough, he could actually make out that is uh, dictionary. And so the white page turned black and black ink turned white as if he was witnessing a film negative. And that statement really influenced me to recreate this phenomenon. Um, so I managed to find the same dictionary from the same year from the one of the antique store in Japan, brought it back in States and I charred heck out of it. Surprisingly enough, the same effect happened again. Uh, the white page turned into black and black it turns into um, white. So I displayed these two pieces together as a one single installation work for a few times. But as you would imagine, the dictionary was really, really fragile. Um, even taking it to, from my studio to the cat gallery was like such a pain ass thing to do. Uh, and I needed to find kind of like a solution to it. Uh, and we were fortunate enough to ask by um, a local gallery to participate into like kind of like pre prestigious exhibit uh, in, in Baltimore. And we, I decided to kind of evolve this piece into something different. Um, thus the Ash Lexicon silver plate came into life. Um, so if my grandfather mistaken these ashes of the dictionary as a film negative, what is the better vessel than putting them into a, could you go to the next slide, Andrew? A film canister. Uh, so I managed to find 108 film canister from World War II, World War II era. Um, and I s broke down the dictionary and stuffed them into 108 different film canisters and we placed them on the charred two by fours suspended from the ceiling. Uh, and if we can go to the installation piece, this is the, what installation would look like. Um, do you want to take it from here, Andrew? Sure. So yeah, we, we, we were excited to be working together. Kay had found a way to, to repurpose, kind of to be flexible with this material that otherwise would have, would have been really difficult to try to keep showing in the same way. Um, and we were invited to show uh, as part of this group show. Now you notice they put us in this kind of small space, which at first we were not so excited about. We had thought originally, oh, the, we'd, we'd put the, the uh, film canisters on a single long stud, but of course that wasn't possible. So we did two studs. And then wh when we were, you know, um, excited to have control over the lighting for this space, something we didn't really have in grad school. Really quickly, we, we achieved this, this effect of having kind of an X on the floor, which brought in this other element of iconography, right? Um, and this dynamic of kind of high to low in the space and uh, a certain drama. So we were able to kind of 
pull out again from from this from this very strange limited little little room um, quite a bit of meaning and and and, and uh, uh, you know dramaturgy, right? So the audio aspect of the piece, which you probably heard a little bit of um, when you were uh, listening to those links we sent along, was inspired by actually me seeing that that airplane that I showed you before, the Enola Gay, the airplane that dropped the atomic bomb. When I saw it for the first time, I was extremely unnerved and I wanted to capture something of the feeling of that, of that discomfort. Um, what's more, I had learned that there was a, a recording made of the bombing run, which had been lost, right? So um, this, this piece was in some way, and it, I wasn't trying to literally recreate the sound of, of that lost recording, but I wanted to kind of imagine the feeling of it. So uh, in this piece, not only was, you know, were we working kind of with limitations of the space, I was having to kind of use research to, to try to imagine something which was literally inaccessible to me, right? And to everybody, you know, so how might I kind of re-evoke something gone forever, which in itself is kind of a structure and a limitation. And of course, you're, you're starting to see here that, that we're very interested in, in real materials, um, genuine things, kind of contact with something actual. And that's a theme that, that will come back again and again for us. So Kay uses real sunlight for his prints. Um, he gets, gets a hold of the, the same edition of, of dictionary that his grandfather has. Uh, you know, I, I will go to great lengths to, to go visit a, a, an atomic heritage site or see a real airplane or something. Right. So that's something that really, really structures what we do. So, Kay, you want to talk about this piece? Sure thing. Um, I guess like this piece was, um, I guess like it, it, it was like, again, like I imposed myself a limitation to make this piece. Um, I was approached by, um, AI, uh, I, Hillier Hillier Galley, International Art and Artist Hillier Galley in DC, um, to do a, put up a solo show, and it's supposed to be a completely new project. Um, and I was working on several different exhibits at the moment, and I just didn't really have much time to consider. But I wanted to make something conceptually tight. Um, it was around the same time I was going through the immigration um, process or visa process in the United States. Um, and I was witnessing a lot of my friend who is also a foreigner, um, the immigrants, uh, getting not quite harassed, but imposed a lot of um, oppression by the government and people's attitude. Um, so I wanted to create something that reflect that even though like my base is a nuclear um, the threat. Um, if you go to the next slide, Andrew. So I created, uh, so, the, so this piece is about a Japanese internment camp. Uh, that is a, a, a internment camp that happened in United States. Uh, after the Pearl Harbor attack, uh, US government issued all of the the Jap uh, anyone who has the Japanese heritage shall go to this camp. Uh, only thing they could carry was uh, one, uh, two bags, one big bag and one small, smaller bag. And that's the only thing they could carry. Um, the name of the piece was influenced by uh, the really famous book regarding the testimony of the, the internment camp survivor. Um, uh, only what uh, only what we could carry. Um, so what I did was one night I gathered everything I would have taken to an internment camp if I only had one day to gather stuff and put them into the book bag or knapsack uh, and took them to a studio and I exposed them to a sunlight juxtaposed with the scan of the internment camp poster. Um, and I exhibit it on the wall as if it was displayed in California or the, the time that people were informed to go to the prison camp. Um, and I kind of like I did kind of like a performative piece, if you can go to the, yeah, these, I actually, the, what I'm wearing, what I'm holding is all the thing that I gather and I made a print with. Um, so this is probably all I would carry 
in order to go to a camp if I have to. Uh, and some of the object is like such as cell phone, because like, you know, the long time ago, like the back in World War II, people would have carried photo book, that one that contains all of the memory. But these days we only need to carry cell phone. But the needing to pick and choose which item to carry is as hard aching and hard as ever, like it, it probably that sensation wouldn't change back then and now. Um, so like, I just wanted to bring the past and bring it to, to today's thing that it happened before and we didn't learn anything out of it. So like the, who can learn right now is us. We can, we can learn from these things and trying to make a better future. Um, and that's one of the things I think that artists shall and should do um, using artwork. Um, so this was one of the limitation I had. And uh, as you can see, like I, many of my artwork changes the way to display depending on the space. Cause I really don't think artwork should have a one solid way to exhibit. Uh, especially in the photography world, the sensation of the photograph needs to be framed on the wall and that I, to me that is kind of bullshit um a lot of time photography can live outside of um frame it can be on the ground it can be like penetrated with the the, the rod of the steel i don't know like it could be anything it could be like nailed to the wall and i, I to me like that's another way of breaking the boundary and what norm of what it should be and again, it's kind of funny, ironically, by placing the limitation to yourself, you break in these, like you, you're making more radical stuff, which is kind of like interesting balance, I suppose. Um, and fortunate enough, that uh, show was uh, nominated for um, the, uh, the best photography exhibit of 2019 by the Washington City Paper which was really um, honored to do that. Um, cool. So we're gonna pivot now to talking about, about our big piece, After Image Requiem. Mm -hmm. All right, so this was a piece that we, we proposed shortly after we had put up that other piece with the, uh, the film canisters. And uh, it's funny how, how it came about. Um, that summer was pretty harsh. It was the summer after grad <laughs> school. Uh, we were both going through a lot. I was especially going through a lot. And to cheer ourselves up, we thought, hey, let's go see a movie. And uh, on the way to drive up to the seat, whatever movie this was, who, who even knows, Kay said, hey, did you hear about this thing that the Rubies grant? I'm like, no, what's that? Oh, it's this big grant. You can get up to $10,000 to, to produce a piece, whatever you want to make. I'm like, that's cool. When, when's the application due? tomorrow cool let's go see the movie so after the movie hey you want to spend some time tonight talking about the the grant nah tomorrow we got plenty of time <laughs> so the next day we get together and spend a few hours hashing out some ideas and we think oh there's all this stuff we want to do right the world's our oyster we can propose whatever we want <laughs> so we're not going to win this grant <laughs> so let's just think big and propose something uh you know that's just really epic so we proposed to do a couple things. Kay wanted to make 108 human-sized prints using sunlight, and photo, you know, chromogenic paper, so this light-sensitive color paper, and uh, and lay them out on the ground, almost like a makeshift hospital or a morgue. And we needed like a really big space, like a uh, an armory or something. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh well, let's let's have this grant pay us to go out and and uh, so I can make field recordings places like Los Alamos, New Mexico or something, right? So we get to kind of travel and, and really come to understand these places. Why not? They're not going to give us this grant. Well, lo and behold, a month and a half later, I get a phone call. Congratulations. You're the first collaborative group that we've ever funded. Oh, and we're bumping you up to the full $10,000. That's how much we like your idea, which is exciting and terrifying because now we have to make this piece. <laughs> <laughs> we promised big. Um, so a lot was happening in that time. I, I was getting into adjuncting and, and uh, my, you know, my teaching career as a faculty person was just beginning. 
and K was kind of working on on getting established uh, as a practicing artist and was uh, you know going through some immigration process. So it took us a little while to get rolling. But our big problem was we didn't have a venue. The armory we thought we'd use would cost like, thousands of dollars to rent a day and uh, had like basketball uh, court lines painted on it. And it was just like really bright, really, really bright. So it would not have been suitable. So we had to figure out where the heck we were going to show this thing, if we could even make it. So I, I had done some fabrication work for a big public art project. And uh, the curator I met through that told me about this building. Now, I had seen this building a lot when I was protesting during the Baltimore uprising, and I thought, that's a weird looking post office. What is that? Well, this curator told me that actually it was a war memorial and that I should go see the people there because they were really cool. Hmm. So we go check it out, and this is what it looks like. And we go there and we fall in love. And uh, it's big and it's beautiful. And I, I do an audio engineer thing. I walk around and I'm like clapping and listening to the <laughs> reverb. And but then we immediately get kicked out because it was closing time. So we did the thing you should always do. Here's a life lesson. Always talk to a person wearing the lanyard if you want something. Because as we're about to leave, we see a person wearing a lanyard. We go say hello, tell them why we're there. And about five seconds into explaining, he says, come to my office. You're having this show here. So we secured permission to use this beautiful space to have our exhibition. And now that we had a space, we could begin to produce the work, right? So we, we got ourselves some plane tickets and we uh, made our way out to New Mexico, right? And uh, New Mexico is, is a big, beautiful, open place. Um, lots of vistas. And uh, out there we met a, a new friend from the internet, Marty Pfeiffer, who's an a, a anthropologist who studies all things nuclear, who uh, you might meet soon because I'm going to have a conversation with him for Apex Art about nuclear culture and stuff like that. And uh, he showed us around Los Alamos, right? Oh, here's Marty, by the way. <laughs> um, so, so we went out there. And again, the plan was to do this, for me to, to, to go record very quiet things in, in, in a place where there's a lot of history. And so here again, we get to this notion of like really going to, to great lengths to, to get in touch with something real, right? Um, this was you know, some of the gear I was using for that, although... You know, a little later, I, you know, I was climbing up these mountainsides with my laptop and, you know, a couple thousand dollars worth of heavy audio equipment <laughs> um, just to kind of get these really quiet recordings of insects and, and birds and wind, right? Um, and Kay, you know, Kay was with me and kind of taking some really incredible photographs out there. It's Kay versus the missile. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I brought with me this, this, uh, camera, this World War II era camera that was often, you know, the type used in by combat photographers. And here uh, I'm kind of paying a little bit of homage to Kay's photograph uh, in Hiroshima. This is the, the sun setting down near the, the Trinity test site, you know, not, not on the anniversary or anything, but kind of putting the sun in the sky about where you would have seen it uh, if you were witnessing the, the test, right? Kind of very similar situation. So managed to get some pretty good good recordings out there and we were off to the races. And, uh, you know, we got back to Baltimore and stay, Kay started to produce prints. And um, I guess it was the next, next January, we had this, right? So Kay, you wanna talk about the kind of limitations you, you uh, <laughs> experience in trying to make these big, beautiful, uh, finicky, tricky prints? Sure, uh, the, the making of the print and the displaying the print Print, both was quite a challenging. Um, it, it's uh, some of, most of the prints are they are all thirty inches width, and the length is something between sixty to one hundred fifty inches. I never really made that scale of the prints in that mass, like one hundred eight of them. Uh, it took me almost ten months. Uh, it's a labor intensive. Um, because the process is like in the darkened studio. Oh, by the way, I, I always be naked when I uh, make my prints. So you are witnessing 108 of my naked body. <laughs> uh, by the way, we were interviewed by, uh, uh, what is it called? Some, some radio, like a radio. Uh, the, um, 
Yeah, what was it? <laughs> Voice of America. Voice of America. And Kay said that, and I was standing nearby trying so hard not to crack. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's, that's funny. <laughs> yeah. Um, but to do so, like, I needed to have a, a studio assistant in order to let the sunlight in from the window and close it uh, to my, the duration of my breath. So, you know, it needs to be quiet. It needs to be, and plus like my print is a collaboration with the nature that the, the intensity of the, the print, the color, it changes by the, the morning of the sun, cloudy, you know, like all of these variable which affect the print. Uh, and usually I really don't have my, much control of it. Uh, to me, that's a, Honestly, like I, I like love the aspect of it because photography is such a controlling way of making art. But I'm trying to bring like organicness to these machine-based art. Um, anyway, um, so after I made the 108 prints, uh, the bi- one one of the biggest issue I had was one the space was so humid. Uh, Prince was rolling up left and right. Um, so like if you just place it on the ground, it just curled it up and you can see really see anything. Uh, and I tried using the double-sided tape, uh, hinge, uh, the fabric tape, all sorts of kind of different thing. I even tried uh, the kind of double-sided tape that used to adhese the, the carpet to the ground. Uh, none of the stuff really worked. Uh, and we ended up using these stones on the four corners uh, to let it like paper do what it wants to do. Uh, and it kind of adds like a, additional aesthetic value. And also like, it's, it's more like afterthought because like we got it from Home Depot. Because um, <laughs> it was such a last minute thing. But uh, he, Andrew's from the Jewish family and I'm from the uh, Buddhism family and like our belief kind of like a collide as like we believe like it's stuck in the rock uh, has something to do with the afterlife um, and redemptions. Mm -hmm. So like it kind of like came into a really interesting uh, collide. Um, And other thing was a lighting. Uh, So this war memorial has a beautiful chandelier. Chandelier? Chandelier. Chandelier. from the ceiling, probably six or eight of them. Uh, it creates so much glare on the print. Uh, one one of the thing about C print is it's really really shiny print. Even the matte paper is really shiny. Um, so in order to um, like so like if I use chandelier, you, you can kind of see it on the ceiling here. It, only thing you will see is a white dot on the print, uh, unfortunately. So we trying to figure out what is the best way to go about it. And it just didn't give a right mood for it. And Andrew came up with the idea of a one single spotlight, as you can see, like a front side of the installation. So this installation was, uh, except for the, like, the guide light around it, it was only, only lit by one single light from the front. And interestingly, like if you place only one light, if the audience comes in front of the print, it actually casts the shadow on the print. So their shadow and my shadow on the print actually kind of like merges together and like making them realize that this issue is not a thing of the past, but it's a contemporary. It's a really subtle way of Im- implying that, but that's the kind of the thing we wanted to do. And it's, it worked out as uh, we thought about lighting. Um, so like the imitation was, the you know existing lighting, but there's a way to use that as an advantage. Um, yeah, there was so much about this experience where, where we had to learn to acquiesce into, you know, to, to kind of surrender into what the space allowed, provided, or cued us toward. So of course, this the lighting did that for us, and we ended up once again finding a way to something far more dramatic than than what we had initially thought we you know, would be the conditions of display. Um, the, the lighting, uh, so not only you know, did, did it provide this drama, but to me, there is kind of meaning and subtext in using this kind of light. It's a Fresnel light, so F-R-E-S-N-E-L. It's the kind of light that's often used in filmmaking. And, and it looks yeah. like that. And so to me, there is this whole other subtext when we'll look at it 
and connect it with that and kind of understand they're having a mediated experience, right? Someone is making this. It just isn't naturally this way. And so that maybe will get them to kind of consider the reliability of media and bring that into the work. It's kind of similar with the way that I use these loudspeakers that are kind of large and, and um, kind of blatant. Uh, they're not tucked away and hidden, right? So you're meant to, to see them, to see the cable laid out on the floor, which isn't, isn't hidden away, to consider that, oh, somebody made this and I need to maybe question it, challenge it, experience it as media, not just as kind of a magic, magical thing that's there, right? Um, similar with the, the stones, you know, you know, so of course, you know, Kay mentioned in Buddhism, what, how these stones are used in, in the Jewish tradition, uh, we, we put stones on, on the graves of our loved ones. Um, I'm not religious and wasn't raised in, in Judaism, but I kind of, it's a nice nod to that for me. Um, and even in, in, uh, during the exhibition, you can see some of the folks here are wearing these kind of booties on their feet, which at first mm -hmm. I didn't love. We don't want them to track in you know, dirt and snow and whatever, but uh, it's actually you know, after the first atomic test, people visiting that site had to wear the same thing on their feet to uh, protect themselves from tracking away fallout, right? So there are all kinds of resonances and interesting echoes uh, that your work might begin to encompass and, and grow to include if you're open to it, right? So I'll briefly talk about the audio for the piece. Two of the loudspeakers, the ones that are closer to our vantage point in this picture, were ma made up largely of the, the field recordings I'd made in Los, uh, Los Alamos and near the Trinity test site. So all these natural sounds. The other two loudspeakers down toward that American flag were playing out sounds uh, of kind of imagining, you know, the different kind of processes of the creation of the bomb, right? Social, social uh, practices, uh, scientific practices, military practices, all these things commingling, commingling together to maybe paint a, a kind of fever dream interpretation of, of the era and, and the deed. Um, so much as with my early, earlier work, you kind of choose between, between the things you want to hear and you're kind of walking amidst these um, images of Japanese dead kind of as you're engaging with this, this history and the idea of kind of naturalness, which uh, is, I think, pretty suspect, right? So all these things are commingling together uh, in this place, uh, in this piece. So we, we had a wonderful opportunity um, short, shortly after this show, which was we were approached by a curator of a, a wonderful museum in North Carolina called SICA, the Southeastern Center for Contemporary Art. Um, which is well known because it, it was a place that, that exhibited um, Andre Serrano's Piss Christ 30 years ago, uh, actually 30 years before we would go on to exhibit there, which we we're very, really excited about. And it's kind of a really important bit of uh, art history and political history. Mm -hmm. And anyway, so this wonderful curator named uh, uh, Wendy Earl invited us to show our work there. And um, we were, we were really jazzed about that. And um, we did indeed go on to show there, but this was a very different space from where we had just shown our, our big piece. And unlike the War Memorial, which is this nice big perfect rectangle with lots of space, this gallery was not a rectangle. <laughs> not only was it this kind of strange trapezoid, but it had a bunch of big permanent walls that you can kind of see here, right? Smack in the middle of it. So we wouldn't be able to show the whole piece in the same way. And we had to figure a way to go about adapting to, to, to this wonderful opportunity we were given, right? And um, sometimes that process of adaptation might be a little bit messy and take some thinking through. As you can see my struggle there. <laughs> mm -hmm. But by being willing to be flexible and kind of work with this space, we were able to kind of reimagine after Image Requiem and our other work into something entirely different, right? Right, maybe not entirely different. There's still four loudspeakers and prints on the floor. But we were able to, to investigate what happened if you, we put these prints up on the wall, right? And kind of up above you. And that, that lent a different rhetorical cast to the work, um, a different sense of hierarchy and relationship between you and the prints, right? Maybe some different iconographic readings about um, um, maybe a sense of... of uh, not just the dead, but kind of the dead who, 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 who go on, right, in, in a way, right? So um, 
this was a really lovely and different kind of space to show the work. And you can see from this photograph, most of all, that it really is not a gigantic, gigantic room, right? Quite a bit smaller than the War Memorial. So we were able to show some of our other work there, including uh, Ash Lexicon Silver Plate. And here, the, the way that we responded to that original small room, kind of using lighting to create drama, paid off as we finally had more space in which to show it, kind of bringing that same sense of drama to it, but now with a little bit more literal leg room, right? So Kay showed uh, his sun gazing print as well, but we had the chance to create a new piece for this show. And it's, and it's, a, a, it's like an experimental film, let's say, right? But um, it's called New Light Narrow Cast, but the, uh, the sound system for the piece is a little bit, a little bit unique, right? Um, so I'll let Kay tell you a little bit about the process of creating the visuals and I'll tell you about that, that sound system. So it was around the same time that the, the, actually the United States government or the military uh, released uh, undeclassified nuclear testing footage uh, conducted in New Mexico, Utah, uh, and Nevada, uh, and some from Pacific Island. Uh, these are, some of the stuff was never seen before to the public, uh, but it's kind of interesting they dropped it on uh, YouTube. So anyone had access to it that was widely available. Only certain people was excited, but I was excited. <laughs> um, it takes a certain kind of person to be excited by such a thing. <laughs> exactly. Uh, it's either going to be an artist or science, the scientist nerd. <laughs> um, so I, as a nerd, I collected everything. I collect so many different kind of thing. It's part of my practice. Uh, and I wanted to make kind of a homage because uh, this is what was around the time I was thinking, uh, even though like I came from Hiroshima, uh, the, the heritage of Hiroshima bombing, um, the, the, the victimhood of the bombing didn't start in Japan, but it started in the United States. Some of the first victim of the radiation and the bombing are the people from New Mexico. Uh, are the people from Nevada, um, and the, the legacy continued on, even though people knew, or government knew, uh, the issue of the radiation and such, and fallout. Um, so I wanted to make peace that solely represents, or the made uh, out of uh, the, the bombing footage I recently, you know, the, the government declassified. So I gathered them, I made a transparency. I Essentially, each footage is like 10 seconds to two minute. So I choose and pick certain frame to make kind of like a 20 different, yeah, as you can see, like a more like 60 um, frame to make kind of like a stop animation. And I made a transparency, expose it to the tinted sunlight because I wanted to differentiate these project from my other project. Uh, and I wanted to have this neon green color. So I tinted the sunlight, exposed it to the sunlight and processed the prints. And what I did was I rescanned the prints and I cropped every single picture and made it into a stop animation. Uh, I, it, it was, a, uh, it's like a five minutes video. I made almost hundred plus prints and a few ten thousands of the frame. Uh, I needed I needed to have uh, extra hand, which uh, we are fortunate to have a studio assistant uh, specifically for this project. Uh, so it, it made my life much easier. Uh, but so I did that, and yeah, it's it was quite interesting. Uh, some of the stuff had blur effect and sometimes I placed object which you can't tell what it is in the film because it's an individual frame. Um, but again like this is I was using my like what it, what was available for me to the public uh, in order to access these things like uh, which was quite interesting and fortunate timing wise because uh, that was exact the same time I was conceptualizing to create something like this. So the sound system for this piece is a radio, a tube radio, vacuum tube radio, AM, from uh, about 1943, maybe 1943 to 1944. 
And so here again is the notion that that we're going to great lengths to to use something real, something from the era, right? Um, so it, it was pretty tricky to figure out how to broadcast AM signal to it, um, but managed to figure that out. Uh, the the audio consists of kind of a, the strange, again, fever dreamed out poem that I, I kind of recite or maybe kind of orate uh, about the, the experience of the downwinders who, who were subject to uh, the effects and kind of um, well, the side effects of these atomic tests, uh, maybe kind of imposing and overlaying with them the experiences of, of the actual victims of atomic bombings in Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the imagined future potential, potentially us, victims of, of nuclear weapons, right? Kind of commingling all these together in, in this, in this um, uh, very kind of sad, anguished, uh, image-filled poem uh, that calls back in certain ways to, to uh, uh, a, a certain line from one of the, the poems of the, the kind of Viking elder Eddas, right? Where, where this, this witch who can foresee the future is, is being kind of... Um, being kind of uh, snippy with with Odin and saying kind of like, do you understand now or what? Right? It's kind of like this this insistence that no, nah, you don't get it, do you? Right? Um, kind of speaking that to authority. So I found that really moving and, and inspiring, and wanted to incorporate it. So yeah, we we were really pleased to get to to show this new work alongside some of our older work, and um, it really does exemplify some of the ways that we use limitations of of process to, to kind of generate ideas. Do you want to, do you want to briefly talk about the ceiling? Yeah. So you can <laughs> see here, the ceiling grid looks a little different than, than most ceilings. Um, Sika was undergoing some renovations for their lighting system and their ceiling, and it was delayed a lot. And um, it actually postponed the show a little bit, which was fine. But the, 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 the state who was kind of funding this and, the, and the, the contractor were way behind schedule and the lighting was not at all in place when we were supposed to start installing. And they were very apologetic and, and upset about it. And we said, actually, it's fine. Just get us a couple of track lights. Mm -hmm. And actually, we love it. We like it a lot. There's this great echo between the case grid of prints and these, and these kind of empty uh, spaces for the ceiling tiles. And if anything, it made it feel maybe more kind of industrial and more akin to some of the environments that I, I attempt to evoke in my audio work. So sometimes just being flexible and, and not really insisting that things uh, be as others expect them can really get you a long way. Yep. So uh, we'll talk briefly about a couple of works that we've done this year, uh, you know, kind of since oh, COVID oh. Has, been, <laughs> has been affecting us. And then we'll pivot to kind of drawing out some lessons for you all about limitations. So this particular piece, I, I was, uh, so earlier this year, I was uh, chosen to uh, John Marvala Warnock Artist in Residency in Utah. Uh, it's, uh, it's offered from the University of Utah. It's a biennial residency that if you get chosen, you essentially get to teach or get a studio get a working space for one semester and teach one class. Um, and it, since it's in Utah, uh, that was essentially the perfect location for me to learn about Downwinder. Uh, I, I was fortunate, uh, the University of Utah has a huge archive uh, regarding specifically dedicated for the Downwinders. And I was fortunate enough to meet a lot of people who associated with the Downwinder community. Um, unfortunately, my residency was cut short because of the COVID. I, I, taught, I, I taught a class through uh, the online Zoom uh, after the spring break. Spring break? Yeah, spring break. Um, but like, I was going to create a huge uh, installation-based exhibit down in Utah, but it's ended up being making it here. Uh, but if you can go to the next slide, Andrew. Um, so I created this 108 uh, sea prints, very similar to sun gazing, but uh, if you can go to the next slide again, and one more. Uh, these are uh, I, that I kind of like a cropped out of some of the archive of, from the book, from the, the audio, uh, the, from the video interviews, uh, 54 from Japanese Hiroshima Nagasaki survivor, and 54 from the downwinders. 
Um, and I kind of made the prints with using the, my regular method, my signature process, and I placed them, uh, mix, I mixed them up and placed them on the wall. So it's became kind of anonymous um, storytelling of the blurring the idea of the victimhood as the whole universe, a whole world, not instead of like labeling as the Japanese Avon victim, United States Avon victim. When it comes to Avon victim, it doesn't care about the skin color. It doesn't care about nationality. It kills everybody. Um, so that's the kind of the stuff I wanted to express in this piece. And really thinking about like as uh, becoming the, 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 the part of this, um, uh, what do you call it? The member of this country. I wanted to cr really create the the piece. Then the collaboration with me and Andrew it does the exactly same thing, but it bridges the culture. And I trying to do exact same thing in this piece too. And this was influenced a lot by the location I was in. And that's the kind of the stuff that the place you the place wherever place you are can influence a lot in like what you make. Um, so this was a perfect example of like the, the land of Utah really influenced me to make these pieces. I just want to say something quickly about, about this piece, Kay. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's becoming more and more apparent as we, you know, as you create more and more work and as we work together, the ways that you're using this structural number, this important number to 108 uh, to, to to do so many different things, right? Mm -hmm. So it gives you this consistency across your body of work, mm -hmm. but but it's, it's become so very flexible and can work in so many ways. So mm -hmm. it's been really fascinating to kind of see you, see you kind of working in, in this grid uh, uh, across different different bodies of work. Also, like if that's one other thing, like if, if I don't have a restriction limitation of the how many prints I can make, I will be making hundreds, thousands, like nonstop. And it's that's true. kind of the stuff you need to have a frame. Like it's, right. it's a limitation is limit. If you call it limitation, it's a limitation, but if you call it framing, it's, you know, it, it's, it's right. a class. You know? sure. so, um, yeah. So Go this summer was the, uh, the 75th anniversary of the, the first atomic test in at the Trinity site in, in Southern New Mexico the bombing of Hiroshima and the bombing of Nagasaki. And I, I had big plans. Mm -hmm. I was going to drive out West all summer, camp out of my truck, my pickup truck, make field recordings at atomic heritage sites. And especially, you know, wanted to be at Trinity for that 75th anniversary. And that did not come to pass. <laughs> I spent the summer in my bedroom where I am. You can't see it, but this is my bedroom hiding, trying not to, <laughs> to be part of the problem, trying not to get sick, uh, trying to figure out how I was going to be teaching online in the fall or whether I would have to be teaching in person in a not so ideal circumstance. Um, but I really wanted to make work that dealt with this 75th anniversary. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so I decided to make a, a three works that are necessarily call them a series, but there are three works that kind of honor the three anniversaries of of the bombing, the bombings and the test. Um, so I ended up creating these pieces that, that are more overtly music than some of the other work we've talked about today. Um, and I released each of them on these kind of three different days. And it was a bit of a struggle because the summer was rough, right? It was, I'm sure many of you experienced the same thing. It was hard not to feel kind of depressed and lost, but kind of hewing to this notion that, that it was important to honor these days gave me a structure and something to work for and to be accountable to. And so I released these three pieces. Happy to send you links to them uh, on my band camp if you want to hear them, right? So that's something that, uh, that I did this summer, kind of working with the same kind of limitations we're all under. So time to pivot a little bit. What are some of the lessons that we might exact from, from all of what uh, we just showed you, right? Um, first, let's talk about, about limitations that are specific to this COVID era, right? Uh, the first thing, and this is something I've really been trying to, to get my students to, to, uh, to understand, is that we should not flee from the circumstances that we're all living under right now. We should embrace what we're all going through and kind of let it into our work. Because you know what, 
when you look back in, in five years and 10 years and 20 years, when, when those who come after us look back at our work from even longer time spans, they're going to look at the work we're making now and say, oh yeah, no, that, that's, that's COVID work. Like <laughs> that, that is very marked by it. So rather than trying to, to keep on doing what we were doing before or make work that doesn't reflect the circumstances we're, we're, we're living in, let it in. Make it part of the subtext uh, of your work, if not outright kind of de making work dealing with it, right? Um, foreground your research in this era, right? So often as artists and creative people, we get this feeling that we always need to be making, making, making. Always got to be applying to a hundred different things uh, or exhibiting. And if we're not, we're a failure. Um, if you're not in the studio, what are you even doing? Are you really an artist? That's very toxic, especially right now. So now is the perfect time to be reading, to be watching films, listening to, to music, um, uh, talking to people, listening to oral histories, finding ways to, to increase the breadth and the depth of, of what you know about what you do in ways that later on, when maybe you have some more freedom, you'll, you'll really benefit from, right? Um, it, it's probably quite obvious by now, kind of looking at the work that, that we've shown you, that our work would be nothing without our research. And so much of it we conducted during times when either, you know, I, I was making almost no money as an adjunct and certainly couldn't do anything ambitious or afford materials or whatever, but I could read and read. And likewise with Kay. Um, identify and embrace media that are actually available to you, right? So right now, if you're, I don't know, a welder <laughs> or, um, you know, if you, you work with ceramics but don't have access to your ceramic studio or, you know, you make large scale public art, this stuff may be impossible. So rather than fighting that, it's maybe time to explore media that, that are new to you, that, that, that you can actually work with uh, you know, in, in the environment in which you're living and working, right? So take this as a prompt to, to maybe try something different. And the flip side of that is if you do make work for the public and, not, you know, not, not everyone does and that's totally fine. But if you do, how might you actually present it to the public in this era in which we can't all just go to a gallery or go to a public art festival or whatnot, Right. How can you make work that is accessible to folks? And maybe how can you actually craft it to be designed to be, to be accessible, right? Um, let that transform your practice. Because to be honest, while we'll probably get back to something that resembles a bit more than right now, what we were used to, normal, the normal we knew is probably gone. Mm -hmm. So we've got to adapt to this and be ready to, to present our work in, in uh, in various ways. So these are some, some particular lessons that I want you to consider from the COVID era. So here are some, some broader limitations that you, know, you should always bear in mind about your work. And by the way, the, you know, this presentation is gonna be available to you to, to look at uh, at your leisure as a PDF. So you'll, you'll have all these slides. Number one, budget. It's really, really easy to dream big and think, oh man, I wish I could do whatever I wanted. This is what I would do. And then you find yourself not doing it because you don't have the budget. So if you actually work to honor the, the means at your disposal and work within that limitation, you will find creative ways to achieve things that maybe no one has ever made before, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's a, a really vital way to just work in general. Scale, same thing goes for scale. Uh, it's great to make humongous work but uh, it's not always so possible or, or even worthwhile, right? So, uh, you know, we, especially if you're, say, a painter, you often hear, like, you should work bigger, work bigger. Why aren't you working bigger? It's become this default statement that we tell a lot of artists as if scale, as if largeness makes the work some, in some inherent way better. That's not the case. Um, we're all learning now to live in smaller, smaller more intimate circumstances, and uh, there's no reason why our work shouldn't do the same. But that's always been the case. The space or the context of display. So we've talked a lot in this presentation about the ways that we were impacted by uh, different gallery spaces and, and things like that. 
and uh, it's it's really important to to really always make your work in some way site specific. Um, you can't just cram any old work in any old place. Um, you've got to find ways to kind of shift it, adapt it, um, to make it really really respect the way that people will actually engage with it. And kind of with that comes a necessity for flexibility or re reworkability. Mm -hmm. Don't make art that's rigid, that you can't adapt. Um, and that's, that's kind of a bit of gymnastics of the mind that you might have to make. You've got to be uh, a little bit willing to give up some control or reevaluate what the meaning of your work may be. Um, and finally, uh, really important, make sure that your work is legible to various audiences. It's a lovely thing to work with complete freedom to do whatever the heck you want, be accountable only to yourself and your taste. But if you want to show your work to a public and have them care about it and engage with it, never mind stuff like collect it, you've got to make sure that it is legible and accessible to, to, to various audiences, right? Give them a way into your work, a way to engage with it. Let it be uh, multivalent, sort of to borrow a term from, from physics. So, uh, the valences of an atom are the different levels at which uh, electrons kind of orbit the, the uh, nucleus, right? And so you want to have lots of those electrons at different levels to let different people find different ways in and to make sure that they, they can understand in some way what you're hoping to, to get across to them. Mm -hmm. So important, don't make inscrutable work. And that's, that's the point. And make it clear that it's supposed to be inscrutable, right? So what are some of the rewards of embracing limitations like these for, for what you do? You'll make work that you otherwise wouldn't. You'll get to go to places that you otherwise would never go. And uh, you'll learn things that otherwise would have been unknown, right? If we do the easy thing, kind of work with complete freedom, we are, we are uh, servants to our own taste as it has been. And we kind of stay in ruts and we just do the same routines, right? But by kind of imposing these limitations yourself or embracing those put upon you, you will, you will become more flexible and stronger and better at kind of embracing what is new and different. And you'll really learn to surprise yourself. Uh, what's more, you end up becoming a collaborator with your medium instead of someone just wielding it, right? Um, that's, that's always been really important to me even way back when I was a painter trying to figure out, you know, what makes painting special? How might I uh, allow it to guide me, to bring me to, to something that is beyond just what my hand would, would suggest? And I know Kay does the same thing with, uh, with all of his work, with cameraless photography. It lets that pull him into different places. And in my work with audio, I'm always doing that. I'm always trying to figure out, you know, what might technological advances uh, and the, the processes uh, kind of... Um, that, that, are, that are kind of proposed by the software I use, how might that bring me to something that I or no one else has ever, ever heard before? We can see it for sure in, in what K does, that limitations grant your work a structure and a consistency. Um, we all know that you know, painters who work with a limited palette tend to have a cohesiveness to their work, right? Versus painters who, who, who use in every painting, every single color available to them. So, um, you know, it's not that kind of broader palette painters are worse or something, but if you're trying to find a kind of through line, imposing these limitations will give it to you. And finally, this is, uh, you know, kind of important. You'll start to create work that you can speak about more readily, right? Um, versus work without constraint. Uh, you'll be able to describe the process of creating your work as a story, as a narrative, as a, a struggle that you went through in a way that audience really connects to. So many of the, the wonderful opportunities that we've had have come from the fact that we can explain what we do via, via a story. And at every step along the way, we found ways to, to talk about it as more than just, we did this and then we did that. And then the process says to do this next and then do that. And it's like, no, we, we're fighting our way through things. We're connecting with each other. We're, we're engaging with uh, landscapes and problems and, uh, that narrative is so important, right? And uh, without limitation, you don't have conflict, and so you don't really have story. Um, 
and of course, yeah, the, the way that, that uh, so many different forms across time and, and different media have used, say, uh, variations on a theme as an iterative process uh, can be a really, really great way to kind of get yourself out of the problem of writer's block or artist's block, right? All right. So now it's time to do the thing that we all love. It's to assign you some homework. <laughs> This is what you get for attending workshop uh, by a couple of teachers. So your, your homework for tomorrow in advance of meeting with us is to reflect upon these questions for yourself. What limitations might you impose on your own work? How might you use limitations to kind of be more creative? How might you use limitations to, work your, to make your work more accessible? How might you use them to contend with the COVID era in particular and, you know, actively articulate how your work would look, sound, or be experienced differently with the limitations you're considering versus what you currently do. So we want you to use this prompt as a way to, to kind of guide you into the conversation that we'll have together tomorrow in, in your individual meeting. We want you to come and tell us a little bit about what you, what you've done in the past and you currently do but then to really kind of reflect upon, upon the content that we've talked about today and these questions in particular. So um, this wasn't, wasn't something that kind of went out, but we were thinking about it, if you're all interested in the possibility of getting together after the individual meetings, if you all have time and it's not too early or too late where you are, to maybe come together again socially in a, in a more open-ended way and kind of talk together and um, network together and celebrate what, you know, what you all do. So that's what we have for you as far as a presentation.